So, bon après-midi. Good afternoon. Shalom. Salam alaikum. And parce que je suis Jamaican, how you all keep it? And I hope you're keeping well. Uh, I couldn't come here earlier in the year, and uh, thanks, Delphine, for your patience for me to come now. And it's great to see Bettina and Daniel. And uh, Bettina was quite concerned whether I would be speaking with my shoes on, and I, I never speak with my shoes on, so you, you can observe. <laughs> okay, so for the camera, if you need to have some evidence. Uh, and as you can see, I, I have my nails done <laughs> to do it in proper form. Uh, I had a good joy with that. Uh, the, 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 um, the woman who does the pedicure, I had to buy something for my son the other day. It turns out her daughter was the person I was purchasing it from. And she named the place after her daughter. So I was like, you're the Casey. And so we had this wonderful conversation. Some people wonder why I don't speak with my shoes on. You could, um, uh, one explanation is it's comfortable. Another explanation is that when you're to speak, you're to speak truth. And truth is sacred. So you establish a sacred space. And in many African cosmologies, and Native American First Nation cosmologies, when you're speaking, of course, truth has witnesses. And who are these witnesses? Well, these witnesses are the ancestors. And you're supposed to stand before the ancestors barefoot. Now, of course, an ancestor is something quite profound. Because think about it. To have ancestors requires descendants. Something happens to a world if you decide no longer to be ancestors. It means you don't have descendants. And if you think about it, one of the problems about the world we're living in is we have now inherited a global leadership that has no commitment to descendants, which means the concept of an ancestor is not normative for them. And once that's the case, then even the argument, look at what you're doing to your children, has no force. You see? So how do we deal even with the global climate situation with people who have no connection to descendants and ancestors? So that's one. Some people also read my being barefoot as, hey, he's Jamaican, and you can take the guy out of the island, but not the island out of the man. But of course, all could be true. So I begin. Because, you see, there are many forums in which I speak. There are many things about which I speak. And I decided for this forum, the conversation today will be meta-philosophical. Okay? And by meta-philosophical, it means we're going to have a discussion about philosophy. But the first thing I would like to announce is I am not a philosophy nationalist. Okay? And as I speak, you'll see what I mean by that. I think when nationalism collapses into philosophy, philosophy is in deep trouble. And in fact, that's part of the problem that's in philosophy, which is philosophy is turned so inward as a professional discipline that it has ceased to be philosophical and it has become a commodified professional enterprise. So I begin with an illustration. Okay? Now, what you heard was tapping. However, I was tapping in 7-4 meter. Okay? So now, when I tap, you could do it in French or in English. You could on the, you know, trois or one, two, three, I'll do it again.
okay? Now, this time when I did it, it sounded a little different, didn't it? Because I said it was in 7-4. Now, as you know, 7 can be thought of in many ways. So I'll tap again and think of 4 and 3. Did it sound different? Now think of five and two. Uh, I'm a drummer. And one of the, I, I play all the instruments, piano and stuff. But you see, the thing about it is you could play. Or, that's seven. Or you could do it. Still seven. Or you could do. Oh, sorry. Okay? All of those are seven. But ultimately, that singular thing is going there. Now, think about that fluid reality. If you want to get, go into six, you could do. Six. But that's a three pattern. But of course, as many of you know, there are people who have attempted to impose on reality not but and they had the temerity to call that European. <laughs> now I know that there are a lot of people want to say white supremacy, European, all that stuff. But man, did you have to take the soul out of Europe? <laughs> you know, people in Europe used to dance, enjoy music, make love, play music. And somehow, you've been sold the idea that to be properly European, you've got to go... Waltz. You know what I mean? Even though you could do the same thing like... Or you could do it, if you'd like, even 4-4. Four, four. This is what you hear as your kid. But you could do, right, you could go, right? Now, the first thing from what I just said, is to alert you to something. Uh, my work, although there are many areas I work in, and I have been a professor of many things, my PhD is in philosophy, but for me that's, that's just a point of entry. But my work, I was having a wonderful conversation at lunch about this, is about our relationship with reality. And the problem is that sometimes some of us think of reality like this. We think it must be contained neatly. And our metaphysics, our many ways of looking at it, tries to see the issue as how to contain it. And so some people wonder, what do you mean when you say reality? And I often answer, oh, it's just what is always bigger than we are. We can have a relationship with it, but we can't contain it. Okay? Now I start with that premise because the topic of the day, keep that premise in mind. That's an important premise. Because, you see, when we talk about philosophy, Africana philosophy or, colon or decolonial thought, they're all addressing that basic point I just made, which is that there has been an effort to look at the world as what 
can be contained within the paradigms we use instead of how those paradigms relate to things other than themselves. And although we can talk about the atrocities of colonialism, we could talk about the, 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 the suffering, etc., posed by it. Um, that could be for a later conversation, because right now what I'm interested in articulating is for you uh, at least an introduction to a set of themes that might be useful to your research that could help you talk about those things in perhaps a richer way. Okay? And so, because there's no way in just meeting for two hours, the scope of somebody, especially somebody who wants to deal with all our relationship to reality, can be encompassed. So the first thing I'm going to bring up is words. And I bring up words because, well, um, there are many fallacies in how we relate to words. As we already know, when we try to define words, we look at their etymology, their histories. And the fallacious way is when we confuse the specific word as the origin of what the word is about. However, if we look at words the way we would as detectives, then we begin to learn that words are stories. And the way words come about tell us stories about who and what we are. And this already opening should give you an insight. Because you see, although philosophy, and that's a, a discipline among others, when I said I'm not a philosophy nationalist, what I mean is philosophy is one approach to theory that is among other approaches to theory. It's just that philosophy proper so focuses on theory that we tend to see ourselves as the custodians of theory. Okay? And because philosophers are so obsessed with theory, one danger happens is philosophers are so obsessed with it, we often forget to explain what a theory is. And when we talk about theory, we ironically talk about theory in ways that evade reality. One particular way of doing this is we tend to talk about theory against myth. But myth from mythos, or mythos, is from where we get the word mouth. And there are few things more mythical than the mouth psychoanalytical too. And the thing about myth that we often forget is because when we think of myth, we leap to fiction. That we forget that from the mouth, myth is about talking. What I'm doing now is a mythical act. The very performance of my, you notice from the very beginning when I explained my bare feet to the tapping. That is myth. And myth, because it's from the mouth, must be narrated. Because narration is how we articulate meaning. You see? Theory, on the other hand, is very tricky. Because, especially in philosophy, there's been a long effort of theory to escape myth. But theory is the meeting of two worlds. You have Thea, which is from Stea, which is from Zdeos, which is from Zeus. In other words, Zeus or God. And so you have already in theory something theological. But Thea also means to see or to view. And that's why Thea, Stea, is connected to theater. You go to the theater to see what happens on the stage. So when you look up the word theory, you often will find the word theoria. But you notice I just said stare, fair, without the oria. 
So what is this Aurea? Well, Aurea, it turns out, is not Greek. I started with a Greek word, but Aurea actually comes from the south. The, that period of Aurea is actually connected to Hebrew and to another ancient language called Metuneter. If you speak Hebrew, you know that Or, like in the name Lior, or Eleanor, or Liora, Or means light. Yeah. And so it means to see the light. <laughs> you see? I know, the allegory of the cave has a new meaning now. <laughs> and even there, many people don't even think about allegoria, because like agora, it means to bring it out in the open. So, to, so even though you have a mythic text that says, let there be light, and you say, oh, that's myth. I do theory. <laughs> There's already myth in theory. Now, here's the problem, of course. You notice that when I explain myth, theory, and myth, I did it narrationally. And this should tell you something. Because you see, if the, 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 the aurea, right, to see already in theory is a critical theory, because it's to see the light that is seen which means see, seeing, and if you see that you're seeing, you must make a decision as you see. And the word for decision, of course, was, was connected, was krenain, to decide, from which you get krites, which means like a judge, through which you get criteria. And so you already see in this act of words that theory already has embedded in it a critical relationship to what is seen. But of course, the problem is, if mythos is the realm of meaning, and theory is the realm of seeing, what happens if you can see without meaning? And this is, goes all the way back, all the way through to transcendental idealism and Kant and all these people. If you just have just a seeing without meaning, you don't understand what you're seeing. You might as well be blind. And so a lot of the history of philosophy has been this struggle between seeing and meaning with this ridiculous effort to overcome mythos, to have a seeing without meaning. And in fact, in a lot of formal logic, if you look at Frege, if you look at the work in formal systems, the fantasy is to have pure designation without intentionality. In other words, to point without meaning. And that has been a big problem for philosophy. Now, this big problem has already led to other problems. For instance, what I just said already gave a model of two approaches. One old approach is I call the agonal model. That's where philosophers say, hey, we do arguments. But if you look at it, the arguments are more like fighting. I'm going to knock down your argument or you knock down mine. And you could say, okay, fine. But the problem with the agonal approach is you can win the battle, you can knock you can win the fight, but be wrong. There are other approaches to doing philosophical work, theoretical work. If you think of, for instance, demonstration, a demonstration is not simply an analytical argument. I have been from the beginning of this talk doing a demonstration. But the thing about demonstration that's different is that demonstration is not about me. For a demonstration to work, it is public, open, it is shared. And I'll give you an example. You know when I was tapping? Did one of the things you may notice is that the old other minds problem, 
the old dichotomy of being inside myself was completely thrown away there. Because when I asked you to count when I was tapping, it wasn't now a question of my consciousness to yours. That was entirely suspended. And in the moment, what was happening was the communicability of meaning. For instance, one of the things you could ask is, how did he know that it would sound different? But the point is, it's not about whether I would know. It's that we, in a community, experienced the difference. And so this should tell you that there are ways of doing theory and thinking beyond a simple stock of formal, syllogistic um, approaches. Now, the second thing I want to bring up at this moment, because clearly you could see my approach, is an effort to have us see what we may not have seen before. We are handed a lot of conceptions of the past and the present that we actually presume are true mainly because we have been socialized not to think further. It's as if if somebody said to you that reality stops here, then every time you dig, you'll stop here. And you never ask for there to be a here. Shouldn't there be a there? So you don't bother to dig deeper. A good example is the word philosophy. Every, almost every Western academic class, and unfortunately these days even Asian Af academic classes say, philosophy began in ancient Greece. And then, they, and then you ask, why? And then they say, because it's a Greek word. <laughs> it's the fallacy I opened with. However, if you do some homework, the first thing you learn is there was no ancient Greece. There was the ancient Greek-speaking language. There were different communities, politeia, different places, where people spoke Greek. The equivalent would be because I'm speaking English now, of calling me English. And those worlds in which people spoke Greek looked a lot like this room right now. In our language, they were multiracial. They were people from West Asia, Africa, Southern Europe. Those were the people who spoke it. The Athenians, okay, that's a specific group of people. Even there, it gets tricky. So, so we've started that, that dispelling. But the second part is then you have to go to the coup d'etat. Philosophy anyway, it wasn't a Greek word. And then it's like, what do you, you know, at that moment it becomes like the sitcoms. What are you talking about, Louis? Well, you know about philia already, right? Friendship, devotional love, that stuff. But Sophia is a rather strange word, because it's not a Greek word. And in fact, one of the strange things is um, its origin was in a metuneter word, which was an ancient language. Some people still speak it. That was in East Africa. And the word it's from, what's funny about words is, you see, we tend to commit a fallacy at the level of linguistics that used to be connected, um, happen at the level of biology. The desire on a racist biology was for polygenesis, was to say that there's no way white people and black people or Asian people could be connected, so they have to be separate origins. And then once Darwin popped up and all of this stuff, and you find that we have the same origins, blah, 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 it moved from biology to language. And so if you can't get polygenic biology, the idea was to get polygenic linguistics, to say that ultimately something uniquely created European thinking. And they even created, and the word, I hate the word tribe, it's, it, it's a Euro-modern term, but, but they created an ancient tribe to represent that called Indo-Europeans. The problem is nobody could find Indo-Europeans. And it's, it is a simple reason. They never existed. But once you say Indo-Europeans, then it seemed like the way people used to talk about the Greek miracle with philosophy. 
that philosophy just popped up in Athens. Well, similarly, it's like language conducive to thinking just popped up among Indo-Europeans. You see? So, and Indo-Europeans are estimated to go back about 12,000 years. Okay? The problem is, of course, our species is about 220,000 years. So, since we know if that is correct, then a good deal of Homo sapiens existence would be about 190,000 years on the African continent. And here's where we come to another fallacy of words. The fallacy of words is every time you need to figure out a word, you go to a dictionary and the words would take you on a path to where thinking began. And so the origin ends up consistently being Latin or Greek. If you end up in Rome or in Athens enough times, after a while, it's logical for you to assume, well, maybe that's where thinking began. Now, if that's correct, that means for 190,000 years. What were people doing in Africa? Well, think about it. In Africa, it becomes... And if we could translate it as, well, I would say something, but I can't think. And it just keeps going on and on. People are bumbling around. And then roughly about 30,000 years ago, that, that, well, and well, well, you know, that, that toenail just gets over onto the European side. And suddenly there's Indo-European languages and speaking. And before you know it, very quickly after it's E, you know, it becomes A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And suddenly you're saying philosophy, and suddenly you're saying, thank God that African period is over. However, if you look at the way in genetics, genes function, wherever there's a greater diversity of genes tends to be the origin of something. We know potatoes are from Peru because although we may eat four to five kinds of potato, in Peru there are more than 150 kinds of potato. You know, coffee's from Ethiopia because although we may talk about six or seven types of coffee, there are more than 100 types of coffee in Ethiopia. And as we go all over the world, we begin to know that diversity tends to be a sign of, great, of, of origins. What's fascinating is if you go and look at a lot of the ancient African languages, it's, it's striking. When we think of words like wisdom, today we only have variations of about four or five terms. But if you go and look at these, these languages, particularly the one I'm talking about, Metuneter, just for wisdom, just for one particular line of wisdom, there are more than 36 words. And not only that, there are all kinds of very specific, because, and it makes sense. If early humanity is figuring things out, they're not going to think, leap all the way to the idea of the, the crystallized, efficient version. They're going to begin with, well, a wisdom about knowing when things are satisfied, a wisdom about knowing how to treat people, a wisdom of all kinds. And if you look, one of the root words that's used a lot is the word sa. And sa has sae, saeit, all of those are different words. And sa, saeit, seit, those words are the foundation from sab, sabeit, and sabeit means wise teachings. Uh, the Grecoized version of sab, sabeit, tends to turn the B to a F. And so you get Safayat, Safia, Sophia. Some places, as in like the Portuguese language, they still have the Sabo sound in it. Now, that's not a big deal to know. Of course, where it becomes a problem is for people who, in their need to radicalize the difference between the African and the European, that will bother them. You see? Because what they would like to say is the European is so different and the African is so different that even at the linguistic level, there must be that radical difference. However, it's, and I'm just using that. I, it's a short time we're meeting. I could go through lots of archaeolinguistics. 
But what you find tends to fit the history actually more accurately, which is that early humanity had languages, and as people go to different places, they fine-tune them for their needs. And that means that the history of ancient Africans and the formation of the people we now call Europeans was actually more symbiotic, was more connected than, the, than far apart, okay? And so I bring that up because, you see, when we talk about origin stories, we often romanticize people. And so my interest here is not to say Africans have the answers to everything. My point here is to talk at this moment about the connections that set the foundations for a lot of what we talk about. And so I'm going to now move very quickly and, and, because, and stop, but I sent some papers that to, to start, and my stuff is easy to find, because the, the problem, if, you, if, if this interests you, there's a lot of material to read. Just from me alone, there are several thousand pages of writing. And then you have people like Giop, and then you have all these others, or Bashir Diam, who was here. And all these, there's a lot of literature. But you know when I gave that metaphor of, of believing the world stops here and refusing to look further? That is connected to a way of thinking that is often theodician. Right? No, it's connected to theodicy. And just very quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with it, theodicy comes down to this. If you take the idea that God is absolute, omnipotent, omniscient, you know, then eventually, and many of you may have had this argument with your parents, your parents may want you to go, you know, be godly, be divine, and you say, you know, there is no God. And your parents get upset and say, what are you talking about? And you say, look, if there are God, God could do something about evil. God could do something about injustice. Why doesn't God do anything? And your parents have basically two classic Theodician responses. St. Augustine wrote these. A lot of people attribute it to Leibniz, but it goes way back. You can find the ancient writings as well. The first response is, who the hell are you to question the thought of God? You're a finite being. God is infinite. You're just looking at reality from your minuscule, tiny speck point of view. God's knowledge is greater. In other words, there's nothing wrong with God. There's something wrong with you. Response number two. You know, God was so cool and loving that God gave humanity free will. And we human beings went and screwed it up. Again, there's nothing wrong with God. There's something wrong with you. Okay? So theodicy ultimately is how to keep the deity intact. Well, theodician arguments despite philosophy's effort to be separate from theology, to be separate from this godlike stuff, a lot of philosophical thought is replete with theology. I mean, theodicy. Theodicy specifically. And I'll give you an example. At lunch, well, one example is at lunch we were talking about capitalism. And I had mentioned that, you know, human beings have had markets for more than 150,000 years. All markets are meeting for exchange. However, prior to the emergence of Euro-modern capitalism, markets were not places you went to exclusively to sell things. There were ways of people meeting to exchange ideas, to learn, to spend time, etc. In other words, markets were very human associations. However, when the argument came to make markets efficient and profitable, it pushed away all the other conceptions of markets and created an abstraction called the market. And this abstraction called the market begins to function like God. And so the, once it functions like God, it means nothing, absolutely nothing must be outside of the market. Everything must be commodified. Everything must be commodifiable. And we've seen that in the market 
the market approach to knowledge because one of the surest ways to get people under control is to shift from the question of truth and reality and ideas to the marketability of truth and reality and ideas. In fact, one of the surest ways to conquer one of the sites of resistance to the market historically was to conquer the professoriate, the intellectual, the thinker. And it's happening right now in the world on the neoliberal and neoconservative globalism. It's to make a professor not think about thought, but think more about just keeping the job, the commodification of it. But it's not just there. It happened with the question of religion. If you talk about the marketability of religion, because God should, if God is outside of the market, then the market is not God. So for the market to be theodician, God must be subsumed by the market. And you could see it with education, you see it with politics, you could see it with other areas. Well, this happens not just with something like economics. It happens also epistemologically with ideas. And I'll give, give you two examples. The first one is the way we talk about the word modern. If you look at, like, look at the way many people talk about the word modern, the word modern has collapsed into European. Now, some people would say they use the same arguments that were used about philosophy. Well, um, you know, the word modern is, from, modern is from the word modus, and it was a concept and idea from 19th century France, and, you know, so this 19th century concept makes modern European. Of course, everybody who studies philosophy would then say, but don't we call Descartes a modern philosopher? And word has it, Descartes didn't pop up in the 19th century. How does Spinoza, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau become modern philosophers? And why don't we start modern philosophy properly then with Marx or, you know, Hegel or Nietzsche, etc.? However, often the modern isn't defined. And if you define the modern, what you begin to find out is that all modern really means is to belong to the future. Because logically, if you belong to the future, it means that future legitimates your present because you represent where humanity is going. And that means your past is rewritten as a legitimation to that future. If you define the modern that way, you realize there have been moderns, plurality. It means ancient Rome, when Judeans were saying, yo, I know being Judean is cool, but you know, those Romans got some good technology, and you know what? I know that we're patrilineal Judeans. A lot of people don't know that ancient Judeans are patrilineal, not matrilineal, but you know, if we create a hybrid with some Roman laws, maybe we'll belong to the future and we come naturally. In fact, it's the same arguments that, say, in Nigeria, there were people who had, well, at the end of at the moment of in, independence, the question is whose laws are you going to follow? The previous Yoruba or Ibu laws or British laws, etc. If you think that's the future, you create a hybrid with that law, you see? And so that understanding of the future creates modern. Now, the problem, of course, is that although there have been many moderns throughout history, the modern we're talking about had something extra. And the extra thing that had was not only saying some people don't belong to the future, but in their not belonging, they became primus. It created the concept of the primitive. And so the philosophical anthropology of this modern, that we call Euromodern, was one in which that was different. Because you see, the previous moderns said you belong to the future if you can hybridize your customs with ours. You see what I mean? So you, if you follow legal systems, etc. But something different emerged with Euro-modernity. It was no longer whether you could speak our language, whether you follow our laws and, and, and other customs. 
a new philosophical anthropology emerged. And that one was literally whether you can become us. It literally meant in your flesh and blood you have to become a new kind of people. There weren't Europeans before. There was Christian, them, the Christians. There were, you know, Islamic peoples, Jewish peoples. There were pagans, that kind of thing. But something new happened. And this means no matter how much you can look like us, unless you become us, you don't belong to the future. And that's what created the notion of the primitive. And that's what also created a philosophical anthropology of racialization. Because you see, early racialization was theological. The word raza, from which we get race, actually came out of Christendom during the period of, in the south, in Iberia, with the caliphates. So, but at least you can become Christian, or you can become, you know, Muslim. However, it was naturalized into a theodicy and now became, become literally a race. Okay? And new kinds of people were born. Indigenous peoples, First Nations in this country, it's all these things that are used. Black peoples. They were, it's not that they weren't people who were darker skinned before. Alright? But, but, the idea of being darker associated with belonging to the past was new. A lot of people don't realize, in a lot of the world, black isn't a bad thing. Okay? In many parts of the world, for instance, death is signified by the color white. All right? As you, uh, many parts of the African continent, India, many places. So it is nothing in us that tells us black must be bad. Okay? Not only that, there are parts of the world where the sun is just so scorching, it's dangerous. So nighttime's a good thing. So once you understand that, now we begin to set the motion for several questions. And, 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 and this is where I'm going to go and end, OK? The first is, the way I talked about words is also the way I would talk about philosophy and thinking. Because you could see I'm critical of the notion of philosophy as a closed system. When I say Africana philosophy as an example, some people think when you say Africana philosophy, it means there's philosophy, the real universal thing, and then there's this particular thing called Africana philosophy, a subspecies. That's not, that's part of the, the fallacy. If you think about, for instance, double consciousness, double consciousness basically says the universal world is really white, and the particulars are black. <coughs> now, the problem is, if you look at the history of colonialism and racism, that particular black isn't actually a particular. Because remember when I talked about the effort to make the European completely different from the black, from the African? If one is complete presence and the other one is completely absent, that's not a universal in a particular. That's actually two universals. They're contraries. It's the logic of contrary. In fact, all colonialism, all racism are an effort to create contraries. It means to define someone as black is to define someone as absolutely not white. And to define someone as white is to define someone as absolutely not black. Now really think about that. That would mean that there can never be interaction. That means that you would ossify them into two substances, two radically different, complete, hermetically sealed worlds. And that would mean your philosophical anthropology would be non-relational. Okay? <clears throat> However, since you have made the standpoint of legitimacy one world, it means that other world will always be a problem. And what some people in that other world realize is that 
There's something weird about being a problem in and of yourself. It means you're born a problem. You're born guilty before you've done anything. And so, if once you realize that, you have to say, wait a minute, what made me a problem in the first place? And if it's a critique of that radical separation, now you're back to the theodicy. It may be there's something wrong with that God. You see what I'm getting at? And once that happens, that could only happen if you're in a relationship with that contrary and the other way around, and that creates contradictions. That is living dialectics. Now, I bring this up because this is crucial. If you look at a lot of what's a lot of what's what I call Africana, which means African diasporic philosophy, it has a double meaning. One is referring to philosophical ideas out of the African diaspora, but the other is going to be what I'm talking about now, something more radical, okay? And this more radical thing always has within it a minimum of three quitter critical questions. The first critical question I've been talking about all along, which is, what is a human being? Because if you think about it, racism, colonialism, enslavement, those are all efforts to say certain groups of people aren't people. They're property, they're things, you can do whatever you want to them, that kind of a logic. And it, in effect, makes the people who pose on them it makes them the standard. And if that happens, then there's a certain point in which if the response is to say, what do you mean I'm not a human being? I'm as human as you are. You would affirm the people who challenged you as the standard. The critical question is, what if those who challenge your humanity are not a high standard? Are not even a good, not even there's the standard? What if they're a low standard? So that's, the moment you start it, you start a critique. That's the dialectical critique. The second one is obvious. If you're going to have slavery, colonialism, enslavement, you have a discourse on freedom. And I don't think I need to spell out at the moment. I mean, I write on freedom, but I don't think I need to spell out at the moment the idea that freedom is a pretty good idea. Okay? But the third one is the part that gets interesting. The third part is when you realize that a lot of theoretical, a lot of intellectual work was used to rationalize the non-humanity of people. When reason and, and rationality are used for such purposes, that creates a crisis of reason. You see? In other words, you now have to ask is even the practices of justification justified? You see? That's the radical question. Dialectics is an example. Many people are taught what I call um, cheesy dialectics. And cheesy dialectics are basically is this. You have a thesis, an antithesis, and you get a synthesis. Cheesy dialectics. Okay? The problem with that is it's linear. It's neat. But the human world isn't linear and neat. And because people have cheesy dialectics, that's what the kind of dialectics that say to the Haitian revolution, that's not really a revolution because you didn't become an industrial proletariat or you didn't become European. That's, what's, that's the kind of thing that would say to, to First Nation people or indigenous people, first become a European and then you could be a revolutionary. However, if you understand dialectics as recognizing or discovering a contradiction, once you discover a contradiction, there are many directions in which you can go. You see? Discovering this room isn't the world doesn't mean the only course of action is to walk out one door. You can go out other doors. You can begin to think of different, and then you begin to ask whether reality is even purely at the level of a particular temperature of matter. In short, 
There's a whole world that's opened up by dialectics, including the ability to be critical of the dialectics themselves, the metacritical point. And I call that the metacritique of reason. Now, here's where it gets even more tricky. Because, you see, even though we can talk about historical material colonization, okay, there are other forms of colonization. When I talked about the market, I was talking about the market colonization of knowledge, for instance. But here's an example of a form of colonization that emerged in Euro-modernity. I talk about it in two forms. The other day I was um, asked to evaluate a thesis, and the thesis was rocking, it was going great. But one section opened up with, the, I'm not kidding, it opened up, and this is a good thesis, so, so I'm not mocking the, the student. I'm actually, you know, it opened up with the question, what do whites want? Have you ever thought about that question? You see, because normally, if, if you're white, you're not living in your head thinking about being white. But the moment you think about being white, not your personal relationship to white, but the concept as handed to you in your modernity, you know what the answer is. It's a straightforward answer. Everything. <laughs> yeah, from the world of color, that's what white people are. White people are, by definition, those who are to have everything. Okay? From the world of color, yo, <laughs> you're like, well, first, I want to survive. Second, if you could throw in some stuff in there like healthcare, education, um, the ability to be stopped by the police and not get killed. Uh, you, you know, you know, you, you're, not, you're not going to ask for everything. You start to think, you know, what would be sufficient? But, but when you think whiteness as whiteness, it's never enough because you are to have everything. That's why we're in a world right now, although there are poor individual white people as a group, there are a lot of angry white people because the world is saying you're not to have everything. And that, then you can't be white anymore. You see? So, but here's the part. Once you know that everything, that's the theodicy. Now put it at the level of really everything. That means now even knowledge must not be out of you. You see what I'm saying? Now here's the part. And this is something really insightful that was developed all, you could find it in writings by Kugano in the 18th century, Wilhelm Amel, a Ghanaian, a Fanti philosopher who taught at Halle in the 18th century. You could find it in writings even earlier by people like Zanar Jacob in Ethiopia in the, in the 17th century. These are ideas that are out there. And here's the, here's the basic insight. Just the first, two ways to think about it. Zara Yako, I use him as an example, argued, you know, why do people worry about philosophy's relationship to religion? He, Zara Yako said, you know, that if there is a God, should God have any reason to worry about your using critical thinking? I mean, what's God going to say, you know, if the argument is I don't exist, then I don't? If you're God, you have no reason to worry about it. And so if we begin to look at this problem, here's the problem that popped up. In a lot of Euro modernity, although many people were thinking this way before, the desire was to put this on all thinking. And here's how it took form. A lot of people don't make a distinction between reason and rationality. When I say the metacritique of reason, here's where it comes in. Rationality, if you look at a lot of Euromodern thought, and again, I said a lot of, I didn't say all, because people like Rousseau was critical of this, Nietzsche saw this, so again, remember I'm saying, I'm against romanticizing groups. Quite a number of people invested themselves in a conception of thinking that's similar to the way I talked about capitalism. 
And the idea was that thinking, if it's rigorously rational, must have no inconsistency. So that's why formal thinking came to the forefront. Now, if you know formal logic, if you have a proposition or a statement, the next one must be logically consistent with the first, which means not a contradiction. The one after that must be and so forth. If you go down the list, it means you move from consistency to maximal consistency. You got it? In other words, your aim is to have a complete system, and that's where the theodicy comes in. But here's the problem. Put it in human terms. Raise your hands in this room right now. How many of you would love to be married to a maximally consistent person? <laughs> Come on, don't hide. Ooh. <laughs> you see the problem? That's hell. The problem is a maximally consistent person would be unreasonable. Reason is not identical with rationality. Ah, that's been one of the metaphilosophical conundrums. If you look at a lot, all the way through, I mean, this is what, one of the issues Kant was struggling with. But it wasn't just Kant. Antony Fermat, the, the Haitian philosopher and historian, was dealing with this. Many people, I mentioned Amo, Anna Julia Cooper, she was dealing with this issue. A lot of what we call modern thought, because modern thought is trying to think about, you see what I'm getting at? Where are we going? And that questioning, that metacritical question, that reason is broader than rationality. The problem is, in a world that wanted neatness, you know that maximum consistent stuff? It defined, for instance, white with rationality. So to be maximally consistent, it had to push darkness out. But that meant it had to try to yoke reason to rationality. But if reason is broader than rationality, that means reason always has a relationship with the darkness. And in fact, even in literature, Ralph Ellison saw this in Invisible Man. Right? There's an example where there was a company that was famous for having the whitest white. And it was, it was so white, everybody says, the whitest white. And they wanted to know the secret. And it turned out that the, um, there, was, there was a black man who was way down in the basement. And he says, when nobody's looking, he puts a drop of black paint in it. <laughs> because if you think logically, whiteness by itself is, has no principle of differentiation. Distinction requires negation. And so, and it's, it goes the other way around. It just doesn't work. So you could see that one of the criticisms is, a, is, is about this effort to have a non-relational metaphysics, a non-relational substance. The idea that you can have an individual thing all by itself in its solipsistic world. And so, those three themes dominate a lot of what we call Africana philosophy. But you see the point here. When you say Africana philosophy, the fallacy that happens is more people tend to want to know who are the Africana philosophers. And in effect, they de-intellectualize the project of Africana philosophy. If Africana philosophy is a philosophy, you don't need to be an African or a member of the African diaspora to do it. You simply need to struggle with its problems. You see? And, 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 and at that point, what we begin to realize is even more. It is a heavily modern philosophy because it is positing the question of the ideas of where we're to go. Okay? If you think in terms of the forms of melancholia from Euro-modernity, 
your modernity imposed on the people we call black the idea that they don't belong to the future. But the problem is they can't go to the past because what they are is indigenous to Euro modernity. But Euro modernity says they don't belong. So in effect then, that's the melancholia, the, the non-belonging. However, there are those who may say, wait a minute. Even if I'm indigenous to Euro modernity, and I have people connected to the African past and others, because it's not only Africans. There are many people who have been blackened in Euro modernity. Whether you're talking about the Kori in, Aus in Australia or the Maori, or, or you're talking about different types of white people of different types in their histories, from Irish to Polish. The fact of the matter is there's a point when you say, wait a minute, I can belong in the future, just not as defined by this present. And this is where I lead now to the closing consideration, okay? You see, the closing consideration, once we realize that reason is broader than rationality, is that we now have to ask different kinds of questions about reason. Now we have a living, living thinking. The old model of thinking is to say that what is, is a function of what is repeatable as the same. That's the maximal consistency. Okay? If you think about the way many people think about, say, ethics, they always say, I should treat you right through seeing how much you're like me. And there are many examples of that way of thinking. The problem with that is, that is not the human being's relationship to reality. Human beings, and I'm only saying human beings because I'm talking about us, but there could be other kinds of, you know, re beings with reason. But I'm just using human beings as a, because that's familiar. Human beings have the capacity to see not only similitude, what is similar, but able to articulate difference. And this is where it's interesting. Because, you see, human beings, for instance, could love things that are not human. And human beings can, within human communities, love human beings who are not identical to those doing the loving. This is crucial, because when I open with ancestors and descendants, it's impossible for ancestors to know what the descendants will be like. Do you see what I'm getting at? The narcissist cannot love descendants because the narcissist is premised upon similitude, which means ultimately the narcissist can only love himself or herself. All you have to do is not just look at the Trump administration, but you could look at what's happening in Russia and different parts of the world. Okay? However, there's something paradoxical about the human world, which is we can build a normative understanding that we are connected to something that will not be identical with us, but see the obligation of, laying that, of, of, of placing those foundations. Okay? And that closing observation is the core critical question. Because, you see, it means Africana philosophy, if it's relational, it is not saying that it in itself is the answer to everything, but it must actually, in relation with things that are actually not Africana philosophy, set the problematic for what it is to do with thinking at all. And that's why if you see a lot of my writings, it's not that I'm trying to be at an exotic buffet to look at a little bit of Native American, a little bit of Asian. No. It's because actually looking at those problems require transcending the insularity of my location. You see? Uh, I wrote a book called Disciplinary Decadence where I talk about this issue. Disciplinary decadence is when you treat your discipline like theodicy or, like, or, 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 or as something ontological. It's all of reality. And what I argue is that that leads to methodological fetishism. You treat the methods of your discipline as if they're complete. However, what I argue is that disciplines 
are living when they will realize that disciplines are produced by, by people. And people as relational mean that they cannot, can, they cannot create a complete method except in logical formalistic sense because then you just have to define domain precisely because they have to be in relation with things larger than themselves. And some people say that means that, and I argue that leads to what I call a teleological suspension of disciplinarity. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you mean interdisciplinarity? And I'm like, no. Because interdisciplinarity could have each discipline treating itself as complete and presented to other disciplines. However, if a discipline is willing to go beyond itself for the sake of reality, what it does is to say that the disciplines of context, but the communicative practices, reach beyond the discipline. You see what I'm getting at? It's when your discipline actually communicates. That's why I'm not a philosophy naturalist. But it's not about me. I'm arguing when philosophy is willing to go beyond philosophy, it engages reality and actually develops new relationships. And if you look at the history of philosophy, whether in China, whether in Ethiopia, whether in Kemet, which is the actual name of ancient Egypt, whether it's in Athens, whether it's in France, because remember, Descartes was saying, well, if you don't call me a philosopher, cool, I'm still going to do analytical geometry. Okay? Whether, whether it is in North America, if you think about it, what Vine Deloria said is he studied law and other areas. He says there are issues that need to be looked at here. We're going to do it. Or in this country, Glenn Coulthard. Okay? Glenn Coulthard uses the argument similar to the one I just made because he argues so long as thinking and First Nation thinking is locked in recognition that it must collapse into similarity and closes itself off. If you let go of that, Okay, if you let go of that recognition, you can now go into looking at problems beyond those. Okay? And in a way, even if we think about problems like racism, that is a similar thing. I always say to people, you know, the issue with, with, with racists is not to is not whether you hate them or you love them. They want you to they don't realize because you know hate is just the other side of love. At least they're still getting the attention. The biggest issue with racists is to become irrelevant. In other words, when you no longer need, you don't need their recognition, when you're busy building something in which they may not be relevant any longer. And that question, in our conversation, we could get to another time, but in my writings, I argue, it requires a new meditation on the concept of power. And I'll stop there. Thank you. So I wrote a, a bunch of pages to respond, which I'm not going to read. Um, I, I guess I have maybe two thoughts. One is, um, one I'm going to borrow from George Yancey's, a response to George Yancey, who teaches African American studies at Emory. Um, he gives a talk to a largely white audience. And the response is, predictably, as you probably know, it's this, you know, uh, I see an angry young black professor. So I guess what I find very interesting about that is learning how to hear. And in the process of learning how to hear, stopping being deaf and stop stopping being blind. And the thing I want to, some, some examples of this, which I wrote in my paper, so you already know. Um, I was learning about Sheikh Antadjou and his theory of so-called two cradles of civilization, the berceau de la civilisation. And the thing that he says about the northern civilization is that having left Africa, the northern civilization, or began the, the, the seeds of the northern civilization, had to deal with some stuff that was, you know, a lot colder and ruder and harder and awful. And certain traits of character and practices began to sort of turn into habitus, in that. And he publishes this 50 years ago. And 
what I find amazing is whether you accept the grand old Hegelian Kantian theory of climate and character is really irrelevant to the fact that having published this at a time when nobody admitted, at least not none of the Euro-moderns as it were admitted, that civilization began even in Africa, much less had any idea where. Uh, this should have been a, 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 a Copernican revolution. It should have turned the world upside down because suddenly, like the ego, like the earth, the West was no longer in its, in its, its at the center. So this is again about blindness and, and again about learning how to hear without getting all angry and seeing angry black men everywhere, etc. So the first question, I guess, is how do we hear and not fall into some of the old traps? And I want to throw out a notion of an old trap. And I'm not even sure I'm right here. Then one day I was reading a book by Marimba Ani, who was an anthropologist from the University of Chicago, who I really deeply respect, and who gave a talk when Obama was elected at the uh, Great Harlem debate on the election of Obama. And she said she had the task one of four of saying that nothing's going to change for black people under Obama. Um, so I, I got curious about her and I realized she published a book called Yurugu. What's the full title? A Critique of Western Thought. Um, anyhow, uh, Yurugu, Yurugu, an African-centered critique of European thought and behavior. This was back in the 80s. And she read the, uh, the canon, the Western canon, as an African or an Afrophile uh, anthropologist. Yorugu is a myth, as you know, from the Dogon people about a child, a, a kind of post-embryo, born without a placenta. And this creature without a placenta was unprotected, and you can begin, begin to see some of the connections also possibly with Diop and the cold climate. Anyway, so uh, Yorugu was born malformed in a certain sense and lacking and spends the rest of his existence seeking to either revenge himself or avenge himself for this misbirth that he is or get back to some kind of reality called a being with a placenta or a place where he can find his placenta. So the first, so there's my question, you know, um, how to hear, how to read, is there a paradox? I mean, when Marimba Ani talks about Yuruku, is she doing, as whites would always say, is she just doing a kind of reverse European modern, this time on whites, the way the guy who listened to George Yancey was? How then, how best to hear, how best to read, how to avoid the old errors? Yeah, you wanted to say something? Oh, are you? Uh, I'm done. Because you said I, the first question. And, and oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah I forgot. Right. Yeah, I do. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, first of all. So, my, the, the reflections that, that uh, the first thing, the, the first thing uh, uh, to say is um, I, I embrace and, and share your anti nationalism with respect to philosophy. Um, and, in a way, have tried to sort of Deinvent myself as a nationalistic philosopher into something else by uh, becoming a, uh, to continue with the political metaphors, a disciplinarily displaced person, a person trained at the high church of analytic philosophy, namely Oxford University in the 1980s, uh, to now being a professor of faculty of law um, and a director of an institute that has everything from philosophers to epidemiologists to historians to uh, lawyers to, to, to what have you. Um, uh, so I, I share the aspiration, and when I when I read the kind of philosophy you know uh, that gets published in the journals that are thought to be the sort of standard bearers of that kind of philosophy, I can't. I, it's hard for me to get through them now, like to get through an article, uh, not because I don't understand it, but because that lack of contact with reality has become just so shocking to me that it's almost like you know uh, it, 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 it angers me. It, it doesn't anger me at the authors so much because the authors have been trained. Uh, within a system that creates incentives such that you know it's not it's not unreasonable for them to sort of follow in that in, in those footsteps and write the way that they do. So the question, but you know, so so th to say that that I share the aspiration to denationalize philosophy, but also to denationalize thought, 
Uh, and here, I'm going to take the, my questioning in a very different direction from Bettina's, is how do we reinvent universities in a way to, that breaks down that system of incentives that leads extremely smart people, extremely smart people, to end up writing uh, in a way which is kind of a closed system, where you know you read the thing, and if you can bring yourself to read it, you say that was in a way a thing of beauty, right? But it is a thing of beauty that is completely disconnected from reality, which would be fine if it didn't purport to talk about reality, but it purports to talk about reality, and not only does it purport to talk about reality, it purports to talk about important things within reality, like like equality and justice and stuff like that. Now, you know, the, the thing that, that, that makes me despair a little bit and, and, and think about, you know, uh, what, what should we do is the fact that as I have become a disciplinarily displaced person and come to, to uh, sort of talk with other uh, disciplines, I realize that, you know, I, I haven't read your book on disciplines, but I suspect just from the title that there might be something uh, of, this, uh, of this nature, is that we philosophers are nowhere, you know, I, I, I like the idea, and maybe there is something to that, that um, because philosophy in a way is the only discipline that doesn't have a, um, an endogenous content, the, the, uh, the, what, what it is about, that we have come to think of ourselves as the guardians or something of theory, right? Um, there's still something uh, extremely, um, uh, I, I'm sure that, you know, uh, a parallel uh, world, Lewis Gordon, where Lewis Gordon does not come out of philosophy, but out of economics, or out of uh, political science, or out of anthropology, could have given a similar talk, right, where the examples would have been taken from those disciplines, right? I mean, economics, for God's sake, you know, the no more abstract, this is, there's, there's a reason why, uh, you know, what's that joke, uh, three, uh, three academics end up on a desert island uh, after a shipwreck, and, uh, you know, the, the canned goods sort of wash up on the shore from, um, uh, from the ship, and there they are starving, they can't open the can, so, and then, then I can't remember, I can't remember who the two first ones, but the, the punchline is the economics says, the econom economist says, Suppose a can opener, right? Um, where, where are the, where are the, yeah, that's, no, no, that's, that's the punchline, but I can't remember who the two others are. I guess you could probably make the joke in all kinds of different ways with like anthropologists and, uh, and what have you. Um, so, you know, dis disciplines are in many ways um, deliberate constructs through which we have devised these incredibly internally consistent discourses that purport to talk about reality. Uh, but to do so in terms that can't possibly talk about reality because um, they simplify the terms in which uh, to talk about reality to the point where, and they coherentize the thought about reality to the point where they couldn't possibly be talking about reality. And yet, I mean, I, you know, I talk to a lot of smart people every day who think for all the world that they do. And they're, they're trying to do. So, so my, que you know, my question is, how do we reinvent you know, the, the, the university such that we stop doing that, given the powerful sets of incentives that push us in the direction of continuing the sort of, continuing to feed the machine in the way that, uh, that, 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 that we do. Um, in a way, uh, that's, that's kind of the question. I'm going to radicalize it a little bit, right? I'm going to radicalize it even a little bit more. So you've just given us, you've talked to us and you know, in a way, one of the ways in which I interpret what you say is a little learning is a dangerous thing, right? So what we get in universities is people who know a little, right? Who know, who get a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of economics, a little bit of political science, or a little bit of whatever that allows them to think up to here, right? And not to get beyond. You have uh, developed a body of work that through tremendous learning, you know, uh, I don't know what your, your, your original background, like what your thesis was on, or, you know, uh, but I imagine that at a certain point you realized that it had, it had given you an incomplete set of tools, such that you had to dig deeper to get beyond that line, and accumulate a huge body of learning uh, that, that allows you to undo the harm that just a little bit of learning will afford us. Is any part of what you're saying sort of compatible with the radical uh, thought? that, um, well, what is the view of education such that, um, you know, we, we can reconnect with thinking rather than uh, the sorts of things that, that we do? Because it could be the case that uh, 
the harm that we do people by giving them a little bit of learning, right? We can either give them a whole lot of learning, like Lewis Gordon, such that they can reconnect these concepts with, uh, you know, a broad vision of uh, the world such as it is that encompasses um, knowledge of history, genetics, uh, uh, you know, a multiplicity of languages. Or we can, um, we, can, we can come to the conclusion that thinking, the th what should be our objective, right, the, the ability to think about reality, think with reality, um, is something that universities as we have constituted them in the modern world have never really set out to do. It's, it's, it's doing something else. It's providing people with credentials that allow them to achieve certain positions of social dominance. Uh, it's, it's, it's doing all sorts of things, right? And we can probably, if we think about our own universities, uh, think about the ways in which we ourselves have benefited from the sort of social capital that it has allows us to uh, accumulate. But, you know, um, does it, do they, do they equip us to think? And if they don't, how do we fix them? And is there something intrinsic to the way in which they have been constitute, constituted that requires that we think extremely radically about educative and pedagogical projects in which the universities that we have constituted would either occupy no place or a much lesser place in defining what the criteria of thought are than they presently do? Uh, what is the world that we are imagining if we take seriously uh, this idea. So, you know, you've given me, uh, and I'll stop. I'll, I'll stop with this. You know, a very powerful, powerfully argued way of sort of articulating something which niggles at my. As I continue to benefit, you know, from going to be 55 years old next year, I've 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 sort of fed at the teat of this institution all of my adult life, right, and will continue to do so until I I retire. And yet, continuing to niggle at my thought is at my at my mind is, you know. Um, how can we do better? How can we do better both within our institutions and how can we imagine institutions completely different from our own that uh, do better with respect to what should be our ultimate objective, which is to continue, and this connects with the thought of descendants, right? The continue uh, to bequeath to our uh, children and their children and our descendants all the way down the capacity to think as opposed to uh, do whatever it is we do within disciplines. And I'm not sure I can think my way outside of these boxes sufficiently to imagine a world in which that's what we're doing. I have a very unique ability, which is I can process up to 100 questions. <laughs> and, and normally I don't let that out, because um, I did it one time where it was an audience of um, a few hundred people about 900, and they all had questions, and they were shocked because I answered all that. But the problem is they forgot the questions the others asked. Mm -hmm. Since we're a smaller audience, that me, that affords time for, that affords me the possible, because I figured given the limited time, it would be good if I got to hear from you since I came up, and in my response, bringing in my response to Bettina and Daniel, okay? So, and I guess since it's being filmed, each just say your name when you speak, so. So, um, um, I'll be one second, Delphine, since it, I think a student might be behind or a uh, colleague. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, just uh, like uh, with regards to it, uh, perhaps follows up the, the question by Daniel. Uh, I was wondering for, because you t talked about the risks of our knowledge that we produce, especially in academia, being commodified in some way. How do you address the problems that whatever who we write for as academics and who do we produce knowledge for. Because uh, I don't want to go up in the path of philosophy and end up writing for the same journals that produce the same type of like, closed up knowledge, you know what I mean? I understand. Yeah. And I'll be, I'll, if it's okay, Delphine, I'll ask you last because we get to talk more. In the back of the room, please say your name. My name is Stephanie. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, okay, so my question is like pretty much between the team and question, so I hope it's going to be answered. But I was curious, you said that you had, wait, um, I don't remember what word you used, but you said there, it, there was a possibility for another kind of theory. That was like at the demonstrative the of your talk. And I didn't really hear what that would be like, other than um, 
disciplines that know their limits kind of thing. And I'm myself, I'm super suspicious about the capacity of theory as a kind of discourse to be able to kind of um, deal with its power problems and like narcissistic uh, traits. I don't know if you understand what I mean, but to me it's just like trusting a like a tyrannic discourse and like being like, okay, you get to have a share of the cake. Just like try to be kind to other types of discourse. And like to me it's impossible that theory would ever, ever be respectful towards like mm -hmm. we were talking about the mythology, but like towards narratives or towards like other types of discourse that don't follow the uh, theories criteria. So I was wondering, um, yeah, what, what that theory would, would be like. And to me, it, it falls between both, because to me, like, the, the nar <coughs> like narrate, narrative type of discourse is more capable of um, welcoming and fostering the event or novelty or new ideas or new content. Theory is always, like, um, Skeptical towards like new and contradiction. So yeah, I was wondering how how what would be this kind of theory that's capable of listening and capable of like welcoming things on their own terms without this dominant dominant um, relation to to reality. So I'm not sure if I was clear, but to me, oh, that's clear. That thing is Thank you. Thank you. Somebody's hand was up over here. It was my hair. Oh. <laughs> Good here. Delphine? Yeah, um, if you don't mind, I'll ask my, uh, same, my comment in French. I don't mind. It is shorter, actually. Um, moi, je parle uh, un peu de la question plus générale qui, qui est même située dans le titre, à savoir, uh, j'aimerais vous entendre sur la distinction ou pas que vous faites entre philosophie africaine, africana, de la donc africaine de la diaspora, que vous appelez africana ou africaine continentale, puisque moi je m'intéresse à la philosophie africaine continentale, à partir de l'exemple précis que vous avez évoqué, puis que Bettina a évoqué aussi de, de l'usage de l'Égypte antique dans l'entreprise de la décolonisation épistémique. Euh, comme Cheikh Anta Diop l'a montré dans l'antériorité de la civilisation, des civilisations noires, la question de savoir si Platon, Pythagore, Démocrite, etc. étaient les premiers et donc les faiseurs de miracles, ou si euh, il y avait une antériorité grecque, et à mon sens même pas polémique, justement, on aurait dû déjà opérer cette, ce tournant copernicien dans la mesure où ces auteurs même parlent de leur admiration et de la science qu'ils ont appris de l'Égypte, des savants d'Égypte antique. Et donc, il me semble que la question se situe plus euh, sur le plan de la construction de l'histoire, donc de la philosophie et du canon de la philosophie qui a négligé, voire exclu euh, l'Afrique en général et euh, l'Égypte antique en particulier. Et euh, je, je référais à un texte que j'ai euh, utilisé dans ma thèse qui est écrit par Anke Granus, une philosophe qui autrichienne qui s'intéresse à la philosophie africaine, sur euh, son article « Question of canon formation » où elle l'identifie avec d'autres historiens de la philosophie, dont euh, Lucien Prang dans les années 70, ou Robert Bernasconi plus récemment, la, la façon justement où la, dont, dont on a exclu, mis à part ces, euh, ces auteurs, euh, ces, 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 ces moments historiques, pour répondre à une théodicée, comme vous disiez, à une téléologie de la modernité qui plaçait le progrès moral comme l'épiphanie de la pensée de cette époque-là. Donc, tout ce qui sortait de cette espèce de linéarité-là était exclu du récit. Et ce qui sortait, euh, c'était ce qui n'était pas écrit. Donc, tout ce qui était oral, tout, tout ce qui était savoir collectif, au détriment de savoir qu'une qu signature d'auteur, et tout euh, ce qui sortait de la raison, donc de la pure raison. Euh, tout, ce qui est pas, euh, tout ce qui est mythe, tout ce qui est obscurantisme religieux, etc., ne pouvait plus appartenir à la philosophie. Donc là, j'en arrive à ma question. Je me demande... Euh, en fait, comme on est dans cette espèce, dans, dans cette, cette euh, écriture de l'histoire de la philosophie qui, en même temps, détermine les critères par lesquels on définit la discipline, parce que, comme le disait Daniel, on n'a pas d'objet propre, euh, mais plutôt on a des critères qui définissent notre discipline comme les gardiens de la théorie. Euh, et ces critères-là sont tirés, justement, de, ces, de cet héritage de, de la modernité européenne. Euh, Est-ce que d'utiliser l'Égypte antique comme l'origine de la pensée, de... de, de 
de, 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 puis je, je pose la question parce que les philosophes du continent sont assez réticents à revenir à, cette, à, cette, à ce point de départ à la pensée euh, comme un espèce de moment fondateur. Ça ne fait pas que reproduire cette idée-là de, de théodicée d'une certaine manière. Je pense que c'est plus complexe que ça dans votre pensée parce qu'on sent qu'il y a une tension entre... Il y a existé de la pensée partout où il y a eu des êtres humains. Non, puis en même temps, je pose la question parce que je sais l'importance pour l'identité africaine de l'Égypte antique. Mais justement, la, la, donc, ma, deuxième, ma deuxième question, sous-question, qui rejoint ce que j'avais en introduction, c'est que dans quelle mesure vous vous êtes... Justement parce que des auteurs comme Achim Bébé, Bachir Zang, jean de Bidima, ou Kassereka Kaviriei, ou Moudimbe, donc je sais que vous travaillez avec lui aussi, euh, vont tous avoir cette volonté-là de sortir de ce paradigme-là, de retour au passé. Donc, à partir de ça, comment vous articulez le rapport entre euh, les, évidents, les questions évidentes que partagent les deux les univers épistémiques et, euh, et, euh, et le, le, le parapluie, disons, de la définition disciplinaire que Lucius Orla donne de la philosophie africana, qui, qui pour moi pose un peu problème, étant donné cette, cette, cette ambivalence sur cette question précise-là. Et je m'excuse, c'était très long, ma question, mais... Euh, je... Oh, non problème. Oui, oui, j'ai le temps. Les... Um, OK. Uh, they're really, these questions are really variations of two kinds of question. And they're different angles of it. But they connect beautifully to what I uh, opened up with and what I was talking about, OK? Um, so, for, first... First, let me uh, address Bettina's point, okay? Um, there's, what's striking, um, uh, um, um, and it connects to the other questions in a certain way. Remember when I opened up the talk? I was saying that uh, many of us are brought into a habitus or, or a way of thinking that makes us not realize that we've closed doors off to other ways of thinking. And a good example is when um, a good example is when um, um, Euro modern philosophy announced epistemology as first philosophy. A lot of people began to think you're not doing philosophy unless you do epistemology. And as a consequence, they fail to see a wider world of philosophy that's out there. I usually start my classes with asking my students, what's the most important question you could ask? And some would say, what is there? What exists? Some would say, what can I know? Etc. But after a while, and they argue back and forth, they realize that you can start with any one of them. They're going to lead to the other. And so they realize if you tenaciously hand to one over the others, you'll never get to the others, okay? So on their own, they begin to see this problem of, in this case, internal to philosophy, a form of decadence. Now, in a way, I, I'm, I'm going to tell some stories that will connect these. The first one connects to Bettina's question is, you know, um, one of the effective ways in which uh, we have closed off understanding the past and what we can do in the present is, is to lock ourselves into a certain type of discourse. Uh, George, yes, is a good example. Um, George does a lot of, for instance, he wrote a piece recently on should I give up on white people? Yeah. Yeah. To which my response is, who cares? <laughs> right? Because those are kind of discourse. Uh, there's a way of talking about race issues that I call our New York Times op-ed. Mm -hmm. And they come down to the model of, of so individualizing the issue, so moralizing them. And racism is a political problem. But when you moralize it, and it, 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 it feeds into a white identity that's wrapped in narcissism, as if every individual white person is a god who can do something about racism. Do you know what I mean? So it becomes, if I could just persuade you individually, to be a good white person, you take care of racism. It's an absurd approach, but there's a reason people are invested in it. Because if they're invested in it, they can actually go to bed at night not doing anything about racism. 
because that investment makes doing something impossible. You see? Um, and what I mean by that is that, you see, racism is not, uh, or if we talk about epistemological forms, it's not really about you. It's not that you individually change the world. And, and so if we, if, we, if we begin to, I'll give you a story. W.B. Du Bois, everybody in this room has heard the name W.B. Du Bois. And you know that he was a, a great African-American intellectual. He, a lot of you don't know that he was a mathematician as well as a philosopher, historian, economist. So the list goes on, you know. Um, but yeah, he had, he had developed a, a version of modern statistics. He did all kinds of things, but one thing that you may not know is Du Bois, when he was at Atlanta University, invited Franz Boas, the anthropologist Franz Boas, to give a talk on race because, you know, he was famous for his criticisms of race. Now, there are things about Boas many of you don't know because when you say Franz Boas, you think of the cultural anthropologist from Columbia University. What you don't know is that he had his PhD in physics. And his PhD was, you know he was Jewish, he was a German Jew, and he did his PhD in physics, and, uh, uh, and they were hiring him. Uh, it, it took a lot to get to point, not only to be able to get a Jewish scholar hired in Germany, but you know it was illegal for women to be hired as professors in Germany. It took, it's post-war Germany. That created this, okay? So there were women who got PhDs but couldn't teach, okay? But here's the part that's interesting. Why I'm telling you this story? His dissertation was on the color of water. Could you imagine trying to write a dissertation in physics on the color of water? And he began to realize the problem. Okay? Because he was trying to think of it as a physicist of internal to water notion of color. He began to realize that there had to be a condition for the possibility of color that had a relationship of meaning, which took it to Kant. But at that moment, uh, because he couldn't find work, he ended up going to the north, spent time among the indigenous groups in the northern part of Europe, where for them, you know, for the rest of us, snow, even for many of you here who see a lot of snow, you're like, well, there's like dark snow, light snow, snow. But, you know, for them, snow is like 500, 600, which snow? In the way I was talking about wisdom. Which snow? This snow. And he was struck by how they could recognize every gradation of snow. And he began to realize, you know, that tapping I did was, of course, to show that we bring meaning to the world because I was just tapping. But you notice the condition of the possibility was the conceptualization of numbers that affected sound. I was actually just performing transcendental argumentation. That's what actually what I was doing. It was just a transcendental argument, perform. Now, the thing when Boaz went back, uh, when he left Germany, because in the U.S., Eunice, the United States was fetishizing, and a lot of people don't understand this today, but up until what happened with World War II, the undisputed best place to do any education was Germany. Just end of story. You know, it doesn't matter. I mean, there were, there were people, German professors, oh, is there a class to start now in here? I said it's awesome. But, okay. okay. But there was a, to the point where, I mean, they, when the United States, places like, Harvard would try to recruit Germans to teach. They were like, why should I go to a backwater lowly? You know, it's not that level. Well, so the idea is German in physics from a German university, he went to the United States and was being hired to, do, to check patents. Okay? But the thing that struck him was the discrimination he experienced in Germany was nothing even close to what he saw with the treatment of blacks. It so profoundly affected him that he started writing papers on race, you see? And he was a great teacher. Franz Boas was the teacher of Herskovitz, Ashley Montagu, you know, who did the UNESCO, the universe, um, Zora Neale Hurst, Hurst, she, he was her professor. 
uh, uh, um, James Walton Johnson, all these great people he trained, right? Multiracial, across gender, everything. Okay? So, so Boaz, this, you could see how, although he's an example of what I'm talking about, right? Because he's trained as a physicist. But the questions he's asking could not be answered in positivist physicist term, terms. And the way in going beyond that, he was able to think through cultural anthropology and, and lots of other methodological questions, also in physics. Because it was having an impact on questions in physics. Because some one of the things he was beginning to notice that he didn't anticipate is what we know it is the question of, cer of certainty in quantum physics. Because once you get the standpoint there, it shifts. But the crucial thing that's interesting, so he says to the boy, the boy invites him and he says, you know what? I don't want to talk about race. He says, because this is Atlanta University's black students, he said, they can read. <laughs> I want to talk to them about something that people are not talking about, including black professors. And Du Bois said, what is it? He says, people don't know the history of Africa. And Du Bois said, what do you mean? Because remember, Du Bois, even with all his education, was invested in the idea that knowledge comes to Africa, not out of Africa. The idea that the Negro, you know, a lot of people don't know the enslaved people were skilled labor. They, they brought knowledge. But the idea of primitivism was also in Du Bois' mind. And he said, well, well, think about it. Look at how old the species is. Do you think iron, smelting of bronze, writing? He started going down the long list. Humanity has had these things before there was even a group of people known as white or European. He said, if you think of it from the standpoint of great achievements of a species, the greatest achievements that led to what's happening in the past, by that point, he's like 150 years, the great achievements were thousands of years happening on the continent of Africa. It just means that different achievements happen at different points, but Africans, and black Americans don't know this, and it shocked the boys. And, and in fact, and so he came, and you can find it. If any of you are curious, I could send you a link to the actual lecture. He gave a commencement address on the importance of African history. And it blew the students away. And that's why Du Bois ended up going to write on African history afterwards and decided to do the Encyclopedia Africana. Now you see in this story, my point. So this is not a story about black people educating white people. It's a more a story about people getting educated, okay? And the reason I bring this up, of course, because this is a case where the person wasn't a black person, right? Now, Fairman, I wrote a piece on feminine boys. Fairman knew this. If you look at his The Equality of the Human Races, he talks about these stories. In other words, there is stuff to learn out there. So a lot of the questions connect to this first point. Whenever I teach my classes, I, I have a conversation with students on the distinction between certification and education. I said, you can get a degree and not be educated. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be educated, it means you have to take responsibility for your learning. So then I have another conversation. The next conversation is, what is a professor? Mm -hmm. And of course, students imagine professors are like Moses with the tablets. <laughs> and, and I have to explain what a professor is, is an advanced student. And it, it's amazing what happens to them when they think of us as advanced students. I said, a professor is a person who fell in love with learning. A subject matter, whatever your subject is, it doesn't have to be philosophy, whatever it is, you've fallen in love with it. That means, that love means you have to continue learning. That is what research, real research is. Real research is you're, you're continuing to learn and Newer students are joining you in this, this quest of learning. Their being newer students uh, means there are things you can show them, just like if you met an advanced student to, to show you, but the fact that you're coming with different experiences, relationships, and a different stage in time means you may actually see something that the person ahead of you didn't see. So my students simultaneously see themselves not simply as people are to learn from me, they see themselves as people are learning with me, which means that they can be agents of learning. 
Do you see the difference? Now this is a crucial thing because what Boaz was doing with the boys there is a similar thing. He became an agent of learning, okay? Now, this thing about being an agent of learning, of course, that's the non-disciplinary decadent way. When we make epistemology supervene over the way, we're always asking, how do we before we do? When certain circumstances, we cannot have that advanced knowledge. It is in the doing that we learn, okay? Now, um, this requires several things, okay? That's Probably only because there's a class coming There is a class, so I'm going to just say very quick, I'll say very quickly, people that always ask, how do you do what you do to us? And I say, well, you know, I, I think about people who had to do things under conditions of impossible, seeming impossibility. An enslaved black woman in 1803, a person in Brazil or South Carolina, had no idea that her actions would be connected to we who are to come. So how did she act? And I argue she had to have acted from commitment. She had to have made a decision that it wasn't about her, and, and it was about something greater than her that she would never know. And so the issue about being a student, about a researcher, do how to, it's, it's about our commitment. And with our commitment, my argument isn't how do we get the others to do it. My argument is in recognizing the problem that is our demand to do what we can. And here's the thing, if we don't think of ourselves like this bottle of water that moves here, if we think of ourselves as relationships, then every time we do something, we, we change the relationships that facilitate others doing it. And I'll give you a simple, very quick, simple example. Every one of you may have experienced when you have joined a group or a community that you're going to do something and you, you have an idea and someone said, Da, it won't work. And you say, why? And you know what the answer always is. We tried it. Mm -hmm. Now here's the thing. Sometimes some people don't get discouraged. They say, well, let me try anyway. And what happens is, it's something works. And then they try to figure out, why did it work now, but it didn't work then? The reason is, what they didn't understand is, back then the system said nobody would try. Once someone tries, the system has to adjust itself to the possibility of people trying which means energy is moved from one place to open doors to others. So the person who comes on the scene in the future is actually dealing with different conditions than the people in the past because the people in the past, their action shifted the conditions. You see? And so, and so in both cases, nobody knew what the outcome would be. But it's the actual commitment and the actions. That is what shifts it. And so when, we, when it comes to the kind of work we're to do, what we need to understand is how institutions and knowledge actually occur. And the quick one, since we have to come out here, the short answer is we talk about systems in the wrong way. We tend to talk about systems the way I talked about maximum rationality. If systems are complete, there isn't anything you can do. But the truth is, the systems we're talking about are human-produced systems. The human world is not a well-formed formula. They're open systems. And because they're human-produced systems, it means human relationships are always changing them. They're changeable. And so once we begin to understand that, it means our act of actually building alternatives in institutions have repercussions beyond what we can immediately understand. And only issues at work, if we go back to that example I give, or I could give it here. For some, of, There's some people who thought, really thought, the First Nations or indigenous people here would be completely wiped out. Nevertheless, they acted. The commitment is what is set the conditions for different possibilities. But we have to understand every commitment is relational. And that's a whole other kind of talk. But we are, so, and class is coming in. So I guess what I should just say is thank you for showing up for this meeting.